Menschen zu segnen. What are your thoughts and considerations on climate change in these tips with many animal species? It's if we can help, we should help. Climate change is people are crazy if they deny it. It's happening. It's very easy to understand the science of it. We've tips with many animal species, even human species as well. This is part of our role, but one of the things which I often notice is that we really always talk about uh, species without really knowing what species mean. And I think it was the scientist Linnaeus who uh, started the idea of a species to categorize all the different uh, fauna, you know, animals on the planet Earth. But there was one species, and he, he had this sort of a, a, a way of classific classifications, a, which he applied to all the species in, on planet Earth, except for three species. <coughs> and for three species, he was unscientific, because according to his model, the three species of Homo sapiens, uh, chimpanzees, gorillas, were the same species. However, at that time, if he said that humans were the same as animals, like the same as the primates, then his research would not be accepted. And because of that, he changed his unscientific in order <coughs> to get his research published. But some animal species become extinct. But as they become extinct, sort of our streams of consciousness go into other beings. I was saying earlier about just our reincarnation. There was in a monastery in the north of Thailand, nothing to do with climate change, but about species. In the north of Thailand, uh, there was a, somebody bought a poor little monkey uh, who had been you know, kept as a pet, teased and was in very bad shape, kept in a very, very small cage, and decided to be able to liberate it and give it some sort of life, to actually take it to a forest monastery where it had lots of space and where the monks were kind and could actually get it uh, accustomed to being in the wild again. So I took it to this monastery and the monkey was really, um, got very friendly with the, the monks to the point that when the monks had their cups of tea in the afternoon, the monkey would always have to have his cup of tea as well. <laughs> and he was sitting with the monks, so drinking the tea. But the whole purpose was to sort of try and accommodate this little monkey to um, uh, his uh, natural habitat. So after a few weeks, they took it to a, a forest in an island, uh, in a lake, sorry, not far away from the monastery, and they released the monkey. And of course the monkey just didn't want to go, he was very friendly to the monks, but he released them. And the head monk there, you know, talking about having powers, he did have a few powers. And he had this, um, in the tradition, the monkey was not surviving there in the natural habitat. He was being domesticated. So he sent his second monk to go to the island in the middle of the lake again. And all he needed to do was call out the name of the monkey, and that monkey came swinging through the branches and just went right into this monk's arms and bit him. <laughs> <laughs> Not very viciously, but just to say, don't ever do that again. <laughs> and so they took him back to the monastery where he spent the rest of his very short life because he was so protective of the monks if there was any noise that uh, he would uh, chase the cars. And unfortunately, though, he 
chased the lorry and uh, got caught under its wheels and killed. But the head monk was meditating at the time and saw it. And he made a mistake in telling the other monks what happened next. Always keep these things to yourself. Because he saw the stream of consciousness of this monkey leave the crushed body and go into the village where they were gone out on every morning and enter the body of one of the women who was pregnant. And if you see such things, don't tell people because the word got around that uh, the kid in his mother's womb was a monkey before. And they were all waiting for it to give birth. And when it did, you know, I, I knew the monks over there, and I asked them, what was it like? And they said it was an exceptionally hairy baby. <laughs> <coughs> There was a monkey before. And <laughs> I don't know that the monks would have told everybody that you know, that was a little monkey in the monastery before. And so <coughs> he would be teased at school, a little monkey before. It was true. But anyway, you know, we take whatever uh, births are available, available to us. So animal species get extinct. But the streams of consciousness don't keep going round and round and round. Anyway, how do practicing the jhanas help in daily life in regards to habits and behaviour that are not helpful for oneself and others? Is it that as we see more clearly the nature of reality, we don't attach too much to our own identities? Here, yeah, of course, and the purpose of life is not you know, solving the problems in your worldly life, you know, having some sort of really good relationships and having uh, uh, peaceful time without any what we call the psychological problems of anxieties and narcissism or all these other ones which we have uh, given names to. This is one of the, the reasons that. Many people start a meditation thinking that the problem is that we're not wise enough. We have more skillful means that we can live a <coughs> happy life. We don't realise it's not. We can't fix up this life. It's a life is a problem. And so in the end, we realise that no matter <coughs> No matter how wise you are, no matter how kind you are, there's a fundamental problem. So first of all, we come to retreats, we listen to talks, to get all these tips of how to live a happier life. We don't realise the problem, again, is our will. We think the will is not the problem. It's just the world does stupid things from time to time. And we can only teach our world to be smarter, to be wiser, then there will be no problem. It was from that, from the, that uh, idea that years ago, way before Google, they developed the symbol of the driverless bus. People like life being a bus journey and Sometimes so we go through, we're sitting in our bus, in our life, and sometimes we see this beautiful scenery through the window. There's nice sunny days, rolling hills, beautiful flowers, <coughs> running streams, and little butterflies and birds flitting through the afternoon sunshine. So nice. But our bus driver puts his foot down on the accelerator hard and it goes too fast and the happy times just don't last that long. And then later on when we go through the toxic nuclear waste dumps of life <laughs> <laughs> and we look through the window and all that we see is this, this terrible stuff, come on get out of here fast. 
And what does our stupid bus driver do? Oh well, the thing driving a life. And it slows down in parks. <laughs> You're a dumb driver. Why is it that the happiness doesn't last as long as it should? And the pain and suffering and disappointment last longer than it should. Because our world doesn't know how to drive our bus. <coughs> So we try and find skillful means to teach our will to do better. So we can let go of pain and suffering. A friend dies, we let it go faster, but we still suffer. The pain lasts too long. We have wonderful happy times, a beautiful retreat, it's going well for you. It's about four or five days already! It's going too fast! But then what happens is we realise that our will is not missing, something wrong somewhere. So we decide to teach our will the skillful means, and like patience, endurance, kindness, generosity, <coughs> open the door of your heart, all the sort of beautiful things which we hoped we should be able to learn and improve upon. So the only way to teach our will is to find out where the will sits in the bus. We take a long time finding the bus driver's seat, which is another metaphor for going into the jhanas. Going to see where this will originates from, like in the mind, deep inside. <coughs> and that's where, when you do get to the bus driver's seat, it's not what you expect. You find the bus driver's seat is empty. There's no one there. The world is just an empty process. Empty phenomena roll on. That's how the Sujimaka talks it. No one's in there. Now, once you see that, once you have that insight, which you can only get in those deep jars, you go back to your seat, you sit down, and you stop complaining. There's no one to complain to. There's no one in your past driver's seat. And that becomes the end of the problem. <coughs> Next question. Where consciousness goes after death? It goes where you want it to go and according to your those two things decide where you get reborn, where the stream of consciousness goes. Similar to <coughs> if you're going on holiday somewhere, you might want to go, where do you want to go on holiday? Maybe you want to go to a pilgrimage <coughs> to India. Maybe you want to go to some beautiful uh, tropical island. To go to those places, to arrive there, you have to want to go there first of all and have the wherewithal, the money, the passports, the visas and stuff. The money is, you know, to, sorry, the wherewithal, that's the karma, the, the, you have good karma and also to want to go there. So you get reborn according to those two things. That is in the, in the Sapurusa Sutta, but the simile is mine. If you have enough good karma and you want to go there, that's where you will arise. And to explain that deeper, one of my followers over in Perth, that I asked them, where do you want to get reborn? And they insisted they wanted to get reborn as a dog in Perth. And I said, well, Come on, that's a real long birth. Why do you want to get reborn as a dog for And he said, no, this is not your problem. I expected better of you. Look, a dog. A dog never has to go to work on a Monday morning. The dog has no stress. The dog gets, uh, gets fed beautiful food every day, two, three times a day. And the dog sleeps most of the day. 
curls up in a corner, no stress, it doesn't have to go to school, it doesn't have to do university degrees and all these tests, it gets free health care from the vet, it doesn't need to pay for anything, and it lives a wonderful life, its only job is to wag its tail and to be taken out for a walk in the morning, and it plays the rest of the day. It doesn't need to stress like you do. So, think about it. Would you like to be reborn as a dog in a Western society? Sleeping, playing with the kids, no responsibility, peaceful, sleep as much as you want whenever you want to, no one complains about you, sleeping too much. No one ever calls a dog lazy, call you lazy, they never call a dog stupid, you get called stupid. And you know, he had a point in there. Then I reminded him, this Australian young man, I said, well, yes, they have a peaceful life in one respect, but when a dog is a puppy, after a few weeks, it's taken to the vet <laughs> to get de-sexed. But that, this man said, I never thought of that. I don't want to be a de-sexed dog. He liked his sensory pleasures. So that was the end of that. So, but we'd like to be reborn. Sometimes people like to be reborn as rich people, famous people, and they're ultra stupid. In Plato's Republic, just the last chapter on rebirth, reincarnation, that's where so when people die, this is Plato's idea, current in Greece at the time, they get taken by the ferryman over the river Styx, S-T-Y-X. That's why when you said this place was out in the Styx, I don't think you meant the Greek version, S-T-Y-X. And then they go to the Elysian Fields, a place of rest and beauty and, and relaxation. And then eventually they get reborn and uh, taken over the river Lethe, L-E-T-H-E, which is forgetfulness where they take their next life. Totally oblivious of where they came from. But the fascinating thing, and I thought, yeah, well done, Plato. You know, this is, you know, you, you, you've got captured this one. You can choose where you're going to be reborn. And all the smart people, they choose an ordinary life, not famous, not notorious, in the middle somewhere. It's all the fools decide to be the generals and the very rich people and the very famous people and the prime ministers and the presidents <laughs> never having any rest and always getting criticised and he said I don't know why people choose to be famous so a lot of times we choose that because we think that's going to be fulfilling but after we become a wise Jews now that was it Next question, can you explain the concept of non-self? Yes, I can. <laughs> That's what they asked. <laughs> because that question will take all you. And a bit more. Do you have places in mind for the Nuns Monastery here in England? The first place in mind which I had, because I really wanted you know, to have a nice place you know, for nuns, not just you know, some toxic waste dump as if the nuns don't matter. <laughs> so, so I thought first of all, I actually found a place and it was you know, pretty much an excellent location, really close to a, a major station in London with a big garden, plenty of parking, lots of rooms for retreats, and underutilised. And the owner was getting quite elderly. <laughs> and it was about time she moved into an old folks home. <laughs> it was called Buckingham Palace. <laughs> underutilised. Wouldn't Buckingham Palace make an excellent mountain on the street? And a retreat centre as well. Got security, lots of rooms, you know, much more 
um, luxurious than this. And, and the garden in the back. Imagine just how much walking, meditation, and just peace you can find there. In the middle of London, very easy to get to. You wouldn't have to sort of get a train all the way to Norwich and a taxi somewhere. Right next to Victoria Station. Really convenient. But she didn't want to move. <laughs> just didn't have an idea of like generosity and letting go and moving on. <laughs> How important the nuns were. <laughs> so I thought well, Buckingham Palace would be a great location. <laughs> Will you ever do an offset to Rome, to Britain, for retirement? And also, I suppose, an uh, exiting Australia. Oh, to come to Britain for retirement. <laughs> People won't let me retire. And I didn't really sort of check it out when I became a monk. Just, you know, what you, you have to do. Just, I should have really looked at the, the employment contract. <laughs> <laughs> the pay, the pay is terrible, <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> you don't get any money at all. So you can't put anything in the bank for some sort of pension fund. But no pension fund. However, the job satisfaction that's what we're about for. Job satisfaction is way, way above anything else. But best of all, the retirement benefits are out in this world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for teaching. Thank you for your teaching, Ajahn. What about children? If I could choose enlightenment or children, the decision is easy. My children. Is there a middle way? The children, the, they really should only be with you for 18, 20 years. I live in a forest and you see the, the birds forming nests and raising their young. And as soon as their young get to a certain age, I mean those birds, they look after that 100% devoting their attention to their little chicks. And they sit on those eggs. If you think you have a sore bum doing meditation so many hours a day, <laughs> think of those, those chicks, they don't have cushions on these round, hard eggs. <laughs> <laughs> the devotion is in eggs. They don't have a chair to sit on either, they just have a sort of floor. And anyway, when they, they're nurtured, they're fed, and they get to the stage of teaching how to fly, and then the parents abandon them, they keep them out of this. What happens to us these days? Your kids hang around in your hollow, day after day after day, year after year after year. They're old enough to look after themselves, but no. Look at the kids' point of view. They get free food, best food, get their clothes washed, don't have to make their beds, they don't have to pay rent. Of course they like staying at home, and also you like having your kids. Mm -hmm. They're exploiting you. <laughs> and what happens when the kids actually actually do grow up and leave, and they have their kids? <laughs> then they, childcare is so expensive, <laughs> they dump them on you. So you have your grandkids in the car. There's something a bit dumb there. They're exploiting you. So it's okay now, children. Once you have the children, then you've done your duties. Now's the time for you. Go ahead and say. And sometimes it's even good for the children for you to abandon them once they are old enough. Give them some responsibilities. Are you on your own now, kid? So that they can actually develop those skills in life instead of always being dependent. <coughs> anyway, that's what I would do. And also, you want children? Children are expensive, they're demanding, and sometimes whatever you do for them, they don't appreciate it. 
So it's much better to spend all the time instead of even talking to you, you know, on social media or computer games. So again, have a dog. <laughs> <laughs> the dog actually looks at you and barks. The dog doesn't actually have a screen which it looks on all day. That's actually really can you much more than your kids do. They cost much less. They don't have to go to school, they don't have to worry about what they're doing at school, whether they're going to pass the exams. And the dogs give you much more emotional comfort than your kids do. <laughs> You reckon? Try, have a dog. <laughs> anyway, just see what you think. Dear Bhatta, if a Kayana doesn't translate as the only way, what would be an accurate translation? It's, I like Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, which leads in one direction only. And it's used in another sutta, the Mahakamu, well, not Mahakamu Banga Sutta, what is it called? Uh, <coughs> the next sutta, not really that one, it's used in, where the Buddha was saying, oh, let's see the house of the Buddha, what is it called again? Anyway, um, he, where he was uh, saying that, how do you know if you make this karma that it's going to end up in that sort of uh, rebirth? He said, it's just like a person who's walking on a path in the jungle and there's no left turn, no right turn, no U turn and there's going to be a pit of hot coals at the very end. He's going to fall in there because it has to be that way. There's no left turn, no right turn, no U turn. And he says, that's an Akai in a path. It's the only place in the sutras where he uses the same word but in a different context, so you can actually get an idea of what it means. It's a one going. So it is almost like a one way street. The only way is reserved for something else. In the Dharmapada, in the Mag uh, in the Magawaka, the, the section on the path. Uh, I think it's number two seven three of the, probably got that one wrong now, uh, where it says that Ezo wa mago nati anyo dasanasa musudiya. Ezo means this, wa is shortened from ewa, only. Maga, path, this the only path. Nati, there is not, anyo, another for the purity of insight, dasanasa visuddhya. Ezo wa maga nati anya dasanasa visuddhya. Dasanasa visuddhya. And it refers to the Eightfold Path. That is used, that's the most clear expression. The only path is the Eightfold Path. That's one of the reasons why the People who say that that is the only path, that, that is <coughs> untenable, it ignores everything else which the Buddha taught in the sutras. And one of uh, great good fortunes, I uh, forget what year it was, but I went over to Sri Lanka and uh, I went over to uh, Rajiva Rama, a very wonderful temple. And that's where so many of the famous Sri Lankan monks who taught in the West lived. There, and I still see Venom Piyadasi was there. And I went to pay respects to Venom Piyadasi. And you know that sometimes certain monks, and I must say sometimes Thai monks, Burmese monks, they expect to be treated like princes. And I went to see Venom Piyadasi, who was a very senior, good monk. We just walked from Dehiwara, about an hour, two hours walk, in the hot, and he saw that we were a bit tired. So he said, do you want a cup of tea? And I thought that you don't make your own tea in Thailand. You get someone else to make the tea. Can you make a cup of tea for our guests? Can you make a cup of tea? And then he came and he made the tea himself. He stopped what he was doing, a great scholar and market. He served us the tea. 
I was really taken with his humility and just kindness. I thought, wow, this is sort of my which I like. And then he told me, oh, we've got a few other monks staying here. And one of them was, uh, uh, now of course his name, came, uh, he was the one who really showed me all the quotations from the suttas on why insight is not enough, why you need chance. What's his name again? Came out. Anyway, he was there, you know, just still alive. And then there was another monk, this Nyana Wimala, and he was an impressive monk. He was a German monk, and he spent nearly all his life just walking all around Sri Lanka, never actually staying in one place except for the range retreat, never staying in the range retreat, uh, sort of the same place uh, in consecutive years. A real wandering monk, no possessions at all. When I went in to pay, to refer to pay respect, that's when I never expected this. Pickle Bodhi was outside. I went in there and he delivered the most impressive Dharma days and Dharma talk I've ever heard in my life. I can't remember exactly what it was, but I came out with stars in my eyes. This was brilliant stuff. And Venerable Pickle Bodhi only expected me to go in there to pay respects. I was in there for an hour. And he said, what are you doing in there? I said, oh, wow, that was such an amazing Dhamma discourse this monk gave. He never gives any discourses to me or to anybody. This is really unfair. I live in this country and he come in from overseas and he gives this amazing Dhamma. <laughs> <laughs> but then I went to go up to, uh, to Candy, to the Forest Hermitage. I went to uh, stay there for a couple of days and at that time there was Nana Ponika who was still alive. Now you see his name, the author of the first translation of the, um, the, the Middle Egg Sayings. And he was another German monk. When I went to see him, he was when Nana Ponika was there, Pickle Bundy was there. And it's a wonderful Dharma discussion. That's where he told me one of the things which I will always keep in mind. He was a great scholar, a great monk. And he said that whenever you read the suttas, you should never interpret the whole of the Buddha's teachings on the basis of one or two ambiguous passages. You should interpret those ambiguous passages uh, in light of all the very clear, the huge mass of clear teachings. That wonderful advice. Sometimes when people study the word of the Buddha, the suttas, we pick up one or two phrases, which could mean one thing, could mean another thing. And then we interpret the whole teachings of the Buddha <coughs> through the lens of those ambiguous teachings. And things like you know, this only was actually wrong teachings, but uh, the Vipassana or Satipatthana is the only path. That is, you know, it's not really ambiguous, it just falls on the side of, of misinterpretation. But even so, there's a huge mass of other teachings which shows importance of Jaya. <coughs> so, this is an important, wonderful thing which I got from the Anaconda and that kept me in a very, very stable, a clear, sensible understanding of the teaching of the Buddha. So anyway, if it's not the only way, if it's not even a sufficient way, you need the whole of the Eightfold Path for enlightenment. So, what are the other ways to realize ultimate freedom? The only way is the Eightfold Path. Because people think, oh, Sakyamatana is only part, people think their mindfulness is okay, but they don't even practice precepts. There are things like right uh, speech, right action, right language. They're important, they're necessary. They're boring precepts. 
But that's part of the path. And lights, uh, our motivation, not my thoughts. Motivation coming from kindness, compassion, is essential for the path. Gentleness and renunciation, letting go, is essential for the path. So these are sort of things which become so clear if you actually look for yourself at the, um, at the uh, teachings of the Buddha. And Pali is not that hard. And it becomes very clear to you just what, one, what is needed. Eightfold path, very simple, consistent. You know, and even in other, teach, other forms of, of um, Buddhism, even Mahayana Buddhism, Ajahn Brahm, if the rest of the people agree, would you do for us a guided meditation on death? Thank you. If I did the guided meditation on death, I would have to make it realistic. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that we would need some volunteers. <laughs> And I think a bit more uplifted stuff is better. Ajahn Brahm, what if we get stuck in a lower realm? Are there still opportunities to generate good karma so that we can make our way out? In a lower realm, say you get reborn in a really bad, what are the lower realms anyway? You make them yourself to suit how you feel you should be punished. Those lower realms, they are not there waiting for you. They are called mind-made realms. You construct them according to how you feel guilty. When a person becomes a stream winner, when they just realise non-self, they never go to lower realms again. Even if they've got unfinished bad karma. I've often wondered why. And the reason is because they've overcome guilt. They do not need to be punished. They forgive themselves. They let go. There was, uh, in Mahayana, Buddhism, there is the whole of samsara is sculpted on this huge monument in the middle of Java in Borgador. And uh, because I'm very well connected, it's a beautiful man, little Panyawara. He's over in Vihara Mendut. It's another Sulchandi, another of these old monuments. And he's a very lovely monk. And there, when he took me to where he was staying in Vihara Mendut and showed me some of the, the sculptures there. He said, look at this one, what's this? And it was the, the talkative tortoise. You know the talkative tortoise story which I just seen open the door of your heart? Uh, there, it was actually sculpted. It's an old story which I, I uh, rewrote over in Open the Door of Your Heart. And anyway, if you want to know that, I'll tell you another day because it's very funny, but it takes a bit of a while. And also took me to uh, the Borobudur. And there was an old story from Buddhism of this person who was being um, tortured with a razor wheel going into his head, round and round and round and round. And the story behind that was that there was uh, a fellow who had mistreated his mother. And when he died, and because of that bad deed, he went to this hell well. And there he saw a fellow who was being uh, tortured by this razor wheel cutting into his head. And he said that because of I with disrespect and harm my brother, how many years ago, about 3,600 years or ago or something. Because of that, I've been enduring this pain for such a long time, but I was told 
a couple of 3,600 years, another fellow, William <coughs> I did, will come and the razor wheel would jump from my head onto you. So it did. So the first fellow was free. And then the second fellow had this incredible pain. But he said, look, out of kindness and compassion, the next, I think, three people who deserve this punishment, I will take it for them. And I will let this razor wheel cut into my head for 3,600 times four. So that 144, 100,000 years or whatever. I will take their punishment as well, out of compassion for them. And at that thought of kindness, the razor wheel just exploded and shattered. And the fellow was reborn in the heaven realm. If you're in the any hell or lower realms, and you have a thought of kindness, compassion, you can't remain there. You're up and out. Because these are mind made realms. You construct them. If you construct them, you can learn to let go of your guilt, your feeling you need to be punished you're not good enough. And this thoughts of kindness and compassion and forgiveness. You can't stay in those realms. You make the realms, mind made, as you think you deserve. If you can allow faults, let them go, have forgiveness and kindness and compassion, you can't stay in those realms. That's why a person becomes a stream winner who understands non-self and it's not just, you don't no one to sort of flog yourself anymore. No one to sort of, you know, who deserves suffering. Enough suffering in the world already. Why do you want to punish yourself? For some of you do. That doesn't help anybody. The doors, the gates of hell are always open. You can walk out whenever you want. When you feel, you can. Other people will not, even in this life. Oh, I'm terrible, what I did, what I did was really awful. And you can't let it go. So you torture yourself, you were in this world, psychologically, emotionally, never allowing yourself happiness, success, <coughs> never allowing yourself to be loved. Because you think, you're such a bad person, you don't deserve it. You can let go any time. Encouragement? Listening for a monk like me? Yes, you can let it go. You mean I, I don't need to punish myself? Correct. Wow, that's crazy. And then you try it and you can. Forgiveness is part of understanding oneself. Uh, thank you for the question. Forgiveness is really big, isn't it? Yes. Let it go, forgive. I don't know why a person did that, but I'm not going to punish them. Please don't punish yourself. Where does consciousness go after death? I would say, ah, oh, consciousness on self. Where did that one get back in the heart? <laughs> <laughs> because some of these questions I haven't answered. And I did mention to someone, I think you must have overheard it that just like uh, a buying lottery ticket, so more tickets you buy, the more likelihood it is they're going to come up. So I think you repeat the questions in here. The more times you repeat the same question in this box, the more likelihood it is going to be picked out. I know the truth. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, who is meditating? It's not I or ego, then who? Instead of saying who, why not say what? The question is misstated. In uh, uh, Ma, Ma, not Mahashi, that gentleman over in southern India who started this Who Am I as a Cohen? What's his name? Ramana Mahashi. Ramana Mahashi, yes, thank you. Who Am I? And he used that you know, for his teachings, very simple, keep uh, contemplating, who am I, who am I, who am I? But even the Buddha said this, you know, it's in one of the suttas, that that will lead you nowhere. 
It assumes that you are something. Only you have to find out exactly who this being is. Instead, it's like looking for the Loch Ness Monster. Is there a Loch Ness Monster? Just because they haven't found one yet, <laughs> does not prove it doesn't exist. Just they haven't found it. Even Yetis, the abominable snowmen, do they exist? They haven't found one and captured one and brought it back to the British Museum, but do they exist or not? When I was in Bhutan a couple of years ago, I asked our guide, you know, after a few, a uh, uh, bit of a while with him, he was taking us around, and he began to trust me. I asked him, are they yet in? He said, of course they are. And this is what he told me. He has a yeti skin, a hide, in his house. His father found it, skinned it, and it's supposed to be good luck. I said, wow, can I go and see it? And then he said, where his father lived, like his ancestral home, is way in the north of Bhutan, really inaccessible. It'll take about five or six days trek to get there. I said, okay, forget it. <laughs> but the way he said it, you know, was matter of fact, yes, of course there are. Do you believe me? Of course you don't until you see it for yourself. That's why who is meditating? It's much better to say, what do you think is meditating? What is doing this? And then you find the will, who is deciding. It's totally empty, it's a false concept, you misunderstood it. And then when you say what's known in meditation, the mind, then when you start to see a vanishing, you realise it's just an empty process, cause and effect. There's no one there. I asked that same question to Tom Kulu Saido years and years ago, just being a smart ass. And just, he was this amazing teaching, Tom Kulu Saido, from Burma. So I asked him, who's meditating? Actually, he said, who answered that question? And he said, Nama Ruga. Okay. You want to find out what Nama Ruga means? It's the objects of, of the consciousness. I tell you about my life, your ghost stories. <laughs> <coughs> Signed, a ghost. <laughs> Ghosts like to be given some attention, hearing stories about themselves. A few questions on ghosts. What are ghosts? Which world do they belong to? They belong to the spirit realms below human beings. So, in other words, that you've got more power than they have. How do ghosts arise and how do they pass away? How they arise is a mummy ghost and a daddy ghost. <laughs> and they come together and after a while, the mummy ghost gets a, a baby bump and a little baby. <laughs> like the ghosts, do they, do they just have relationships? Ah, oh, there's one ghost getting another ghost. Or just, uh, are they friends? Do they sort of hang out together? And do they sort of compare notes? And just, you know, uh, have groups of ghosts? How do ghosts arise and how do they pass away? They've got to die first. And they pass away just when they realise they don't need to be ghosts anymore. They make their rooms and so they can disappear from them. What appearance do they take? Is it what they look like at death? Yeah, there was a nice little story. A, um, it was an Australian builder. He lived in Kalgoorlie, which is you know, a, uh, a gold mining town. And he developed cancer. And one of his friends, he was a businessman, he was actually a builder, but you know, he employed other people for the building. And so when this uh, Aussie Builder got cancer. 
and his maintenance of Singaporean brought him down to Perth to see him to get some advice. And there he came, he was just Australian national dress. <laughs> Plastic sandals, shorts, and a dirty seatbelt. We call that Australian national dress. You know, no suits or anything. And anyway, that, you know, gave him some advice and he died a few days, a few weeks later. And so my friend Victor went off to the funeral in Kalgoorlie because he knew the family, consoled the wife. It was a closed coffin. Mm -hmm. And a few days later, when he was back in Perth, you know, he woke up in the middle of the night and he was trying to scold his wife because she elbowed him in the side and woke him up. And then he realised his wife was fast asleep. She never touched him. And there was his friend from Kalgoorlie, the ghost. But what really shook him, his friend was dressed in a suit with a uh, polka dot bow tie. And throughout his whole life he'd never seen him dressed like that at all. And he immediately turned to his wife, hey wake up Mel. What was his name then? then he said, hey, was like, uh, um, Sam or something, the ghost. And he said, Sam's here. And when he turned back, so the ghost had gone, but Sam and, no, Victor and Merle went right throughout the whole house looking for Sam. We can't go looking for them, they'll show up or they'll disappear. Mm -hmm. But then he came and told me afterwards, he said, oh, Sam appeared last night, but what was really strange, I saw him very clearly, was his dress. They're wearing a suit and a bow tie. I said, great, this is a nice experiment for you. Go and call his wife today sometime. Little conversation, just how are you doing, anything I can do to help. And then slip it in. By the way, what was Sam wearing in his coffin? And if I told him, no, it's coming. He said, oh, he was wearing a suit and a bow tie, a polka dot bow tie. I've never seen him in that before. Yes, said his wife. I bought it for him a couple of years ago as a gift. And he refused to wear it. <laughs> so I decided, at least he's going to wear it in his coffin. <laughs> and that's how he saw him. There is the other story of a, another, another gentleman. He was a very successful businessman, but a little bit crooked. Actually, a lot crooked. <laughs> so when he was on his deathbed, he told his wife, this is my last will and testament, you better follow my instructions. I will be placed in my coffin naked. No cross on me. So we can afford something. He said, look, throughout my whole life, I don't want to waste anything. It only just get burnt up. What's the point of putting this stuff on my body when it's about to sort of uh, be all burnt up? And anyway, he said, I know where I'm going. I admit it. And down there, you don't need any clothes. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> so she had to... She had to follow the instructions out of respect for her husband. She sort of uh, cremated him naked. And three or four days later, his ghost came. Naked. <laughs> and said, Wife, have you got any of my clothes left? <laughs> and I, I, like that jumper I used when I did some gardening, the old gardening trousers. I said, what are you talking about? I, I thought you went down to, uh, downstairs to hell. I said, yes, I did. I'm in hell. But don't you know it? There are certainly wealthy people down there. They've installed aircon. It's <laughs> <laughs> a joke. <laughs> Do they have special powers? Each you able to pass through walls? Yeah. They pass through walls and 
Uh, in Thailand, they always said that you can tell a ghost sometimes because they can actually walk about an inch above the ground. But they, you know, sometimes they do that, sometimes they don't. And sometimes they can be solid. Make themselves visible to some people, not others. Can they possess a real person's body? It's very, very rare they can do that. But now I've seen a couple of times when they do that. And it's usually the person they're possessing is very weak, like very sick, very old. And a lot of times, it's, you know, there's some purpose to that. They've got to warn them, do something, or tell them that something's happening. That's the only way they can actually tell people what's about to happen. But it's incredibly rare that you see any possession. Most times, when people say they are possessed by a ghost, 99% of the time it's uh, some mental illness, schizophrenia or something. Most of the time. But they can do that. Very well. Ghosts. There was, what was the other story about uh, one of the friends from Australia. She came to the UK, you know, for a holiday. And any Australians who come to the UK, they have to go and visit a castle. They don't have castles, you know, in the UK. Eh, sorry, in uh, Australia. So they went to a castle, but I don't remember where it was. And even though that she didn't ever believe in ghosts in Australia, that when she went to one of these castles and was taken by the guy you know, to the underground passages and the, the dungeons and stuff, that was really spooky. And every floorboard which they trod on, and they opened the doors, everything was creaky. And even when they passed the window, <laughs> that's the only special effects I had. <laughs> And by the end of the tour, she was glad to get up in the open air. But she had to ask the guide, are there any ghosts in these dungeons, in this castle? And the guide replied to her, in all the years I've lived in this castle, I've never seen a ghost. She was relieved. But then she had to ask the second question, how long have you been living in this castle? <laughs> Over 300 years. <laughs> <laughs> you shouldn't ask questions like that. <laughs> That's a joke. I once heard that if you can catch the feeling when you wake up, that is the base note of your being. I've never heard that before. If it is sad and not eager to get up and into the day, is there anything that can change that? I read there is a depression gene identified. Can one change genetic predisposition? Of course you can. Change anything. Your mind is plastic. The plastic brain. So your mind can actually interfere with the brain and basically rewire it sometimes. So, the plastic brain. So, if you wake up in the morning, what do you do? <laughs> Good morning, me. Here I am again. Nice to see you. Every day. Kind of, you're in the habit of doing that. If you do things like that, and then when you come to the chanting, you know, instead of going, this is what you <laughs> We get to the end of the chanting, and how does it go? By not holding to wrong views. Uh, Greed from what senses eyes is not born again into this world. Sadhu, sadhu. That requires your brain to have a happy morning. <laughs> Yeah, some more, some energy, and it actually works. Sometimes people like coming for the charging just for that ending. <laughs> <laughs> so, it does put energy in all kinds of things. 
A few years ago, in a retreat, I was practicing out of Bhagavad and the teacher told me not to focus on a particular eye because it was my third eye. I said, I've got four eyes. One, two, three, four. They used to call people with, with glasses and four eyes. Your third eye, not just the third eye. Do you know if this is a real thing and how we should distinguish it from a limiter? You know, it's just a limiter. There's nowhere in the suttas talking about third eye. However, one of the first books I read as a Buddhist was The Third Eye by Rob Sandvampa. It was a really good novel, I had nothing much to do with Buddhism, but nevertheless a nice read. <laughs> He was a plumber from Ireland, Rob Sandrampa. A really good author, really nice and models. Anyway, so it's not your third eye, limiters and limiters. It's mentioned by the Buddha. You know, it's the, uh, say, Upakrasa Sutta. It's just what happens. It's the Prabhasara Jitta, the radiant mind. So, anyway, why do Buddha not put thoughts as one of the hindrances? It's because it's covered in restlessness. Lots and lots and lots of thoughts. That's why it's, it's there. But what the Buddha did say, he really just put down thoughts. He said, just like a young man or young woman going out for the night, some party or some dance or some ceremony, they dress in their very best clothes and they would wash and they would perfume themselves. You know, the guys would perfume themselves as well. And then after doing all of that grooming, they realised that by mistake they put on a garland of carcasses of dead dogs. It's pretty gross, he said. That's like putting thoughts around your beautiful pure mind. He compared to them to carcasses of dead dogs. Ooh. That's pretty playing on the line. But your thoughts are old things. The thoughts aren't new, aren't innovative. They're old ways of looking. They are dead stuff. So anyway, mine was actually to not however, these days we celebrate thinking. Great thinkers. Have you ever seen a great thinker being a kind person? They're usually just so into thoughts, hiding with people who's got the right thoughts and who's got the wrong thoughts. They don't know peace and stillness. And compassion isn't a thought. <coughs> compassion is something that comes away before thoughts arise. Kindness and stillness. So that's one of the reasons why the Buddha did put down thoughts. Unfortunately, our culture just celebrates thoughts. When I was a kid, I sort of remember my name was Peter. Peter, what do you think of that? I think. And you were considered to be stupid because you didn't think. You could have been in mind so much faster. We didn't go to schools where they taught people to always think and have an opinion about things. So what do you think about that anecdote? I <laughs> <laughs> think. Excellent. We're mm. on the path. <laughs> With peace we don't argue. With thoughts we argue. Who's got the right thought? Who's got the wrong thought? Our jhana is essential in meditation. <coughs> Our jhana is essential in meditation to progress and see energy different. How do jhana certainly see this reality and its purpose? Or do you have to follow the Satipatthana Sutra as well? To get to jhanas, you have to follow all of the eightfold paths, including the right mindfulness. That's Satipatthana is part of it. You get the jhanas. No. They don't even actually say it's essential, it's just what happens. It's what happens when you sort of start meditating. You let go, eventually those things occur. It's just part of the path, part of the journey. Are they really essential? 
Cos'è? Otherwise, the Buddha, uh, with great compassion, would not have told them. He would have told them a sevenfold path. <laughs> so he didn't have to get tired, just to set up the time. Wouldn't that be easier? This is the easy path. What does it mean to have a black minute? A, co <coughs> a colour significant? The only person who ever had a black minute, I was doubting him at first, was that person I mentioned who used to be a pilot in his future life. And his profession, his job, <laughs> was a pest exterminator. <laughs> he had his black minute. And I really asked him, I said, Are you sure this is a minute? He said, Describe it to me. He said, It was like black satin deep, the most beautiful black you'd ever seen. It was dark, but it was not dull or scary. It was incredibly vibrant, shimmering black. And the way he described it, okay, that's a minute. Now the color was important. But it's otherworldliness and beauty and shimmer that was. And just you know, the excitement and the, the power it had over him at the time. Do you think that Jesus was probably enlightened and his followers should have worked from being enlightened to to instead of creating a religion based on him being the Son of God? I don't really don't know. It's just a long time ago because I mean there are the we see the Jesus of the Gnostics in the Nakamadi Library, the Gnostics, and there are some really strange things about Jesus, such as sayings of Jesus, which you don't see in the Christian Bible. One of those translations, please excuse the gender specificity. He said, he who knows himself knows the truth of all things. I mean, that's, that's pretty sort of Buddhist. You know the truth of yourself, you know the truth of all things. So anyway, cool. So that was uh, in the Gnostic Gospels. And then I think the Gospel of Thomas in the Gnostic Gospels, that God is in his heaven saying, I am the best, I am the chief, I am the founder, blah, 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 the usual stuff. And then someone says, no, you're not, there's other beings in this cosmos that you don't even know about. Who said that? Who said that? That was in the Christian Gnostic Gospels. What in the tables calls suppressed Christianity. Another form of Christianity. I don't know if you also know the story that uh, up in heaven one day, St. Peter sent an urgent email to Jesus. You better come to the pearly gates now. <laughs> And Jesus said, I'm really busy, you know, it's a busy thing. I've got some responsibility. Now you better come now. You you need to come. So he turned up at the pearly gates. He said, See that fellow over there? Wanting to come in. He says his name is Joseph. He's a carpenter. <laughs> I think you better talk to this fellow. He may be your father. So Jesus went up to this fellow and said, what's your name? He said, Joseph. What was your profession? A carpenter. Did you have any children? Well, my wife had a child, I'm not quite sure if it was mine or not. <laughs> Describe him to me. <laughs> Jesus was getting very excited. Because even if it may not have been your, your father, adopted father, stepfather, you know, you follow the same bonds with him. So describe it to me. Well, actually, my son, he had holes in his hands and feet. Dad! Father! And Joseph says, Pinocchio? As 
the time going? How much my watch? It's 20 past nine. Okay, about another 10 minutes to finish off. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, well, let's just find a question. That story about an Australian mum who got lost, man who got lost in the Himalayan mountains. Is the fabrication or true story? If it is true, is there any other way to know what is behind the fire and gold door? Don't say you do not allow to tell me because I am not a monk. Of course, I can't break my rules for you. I know that you do not have enough capacity for the other monks, so you have more monks to which the faith of being with Australia, the being suitable to hear the, the secret. Please tell us, otherwise you might go crazy. <laughs> 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 you all know that story of the fellow that lost in Himalayas, found a monastery and heard the most amazing sound in the world and had to go through four doors to find, had to become a monk first of all to find out the secret. If you don't know, it's an open, open the door of your heart, isn't it? Or is it good about who knows what? One of us, it's in one of those books anyway. So read the book first of all. Find out the story. <laughs> and the monk said that he can't tell you unless you become a monk. Or a nun. Sorry? Or a nun. Oh, a no, nun, yeah, the monastic, yeah. So you can ask uh, Benoit Chanda. Chanda. When recent trouble incident occurred in BSW, did you get hurt at all even temporarily? Yeah. Now that was just the politics of running a community. Actually not the monks, the monks are great. This is just the committees and stuff. They all think they're doing the right thing, but sometimes that they oh, they they have egos and and try to do the best, but they're not you know, really following what's really going on. I would just have thought how some people can be ungrateful to a person who has been devoted most of their life to BSW in general. Do you ever get angry or upset? No! Do I jump on? Am I better off being a screen winner or a screen loser? <laughs> <laughs> and could you please explain what a stream winner is? A stream winner is someone who has been wandering up in that mountain and gets underneath the mist and understands you know, what's going on. <coughs> stream winner is a person who is a Buddhist symbol, who is um, a shipwrecked sailor at sea, bobbing around, managed to see dry land to see safety. That was the one the Buddha simulates. So once you see where the safety is about and is, then you'll go for it. So a stream loser, you're a samsara loser. You lose the round of rebirth. Another simile is like a, a comet. It's, usually it's just a mass of ice going round and round and round and round our solar system. Now since so many thousands, millions of years, round and round it goes. And after so many revolutions around Samsara, it manages to meet the planet Earth. And then as it strikes the atmosphere, it burns out this beautiful flash of light of comets in the night sky, a meteors and explodes and brilliant and lights up the sky and then disappears forever. That's it. When boredom arises during the breath meditation, after approximately 30 to 40 uh, minutes, what can I do to overcome this and go back to the breath? Also, why does boredom arise? Because it can create some happiness. So what you can do is <coughs> to do the backwards breath meditation method. Breathe backwards. I will now demonstrate backwards breath meditation for you. Innovation. So, don't change your posture. 
is to close your eyes, breathe in and out three times, and after the third breath, open your eyes. Okay, go. Just three breaths. Now, I'm pretty sure when you breathe three breaths, counted them, you started with the in breath. In, out, in, out, in, out. To do backwards breath meditation, I want you to start with the out breath first. Out, in, out, in, out, in. Okay, go. After the third in breath of the eyes, you'll discover that it's different. It's not the same as being in, out, in, out, in, out, out, in, out, in, out, in. It's got a different feel to it. You explore and experiment. <coughs> Don't always do things the same way. <coughs> that makes you bored. In the morning when you get up out of bed, I hope you brush your teeth. Which side of the mouth do you start with? Is it top left or middle bottom inside? There's so many ways to start something as simple as brushing your own teeth. How about doing things <coughs> that takes mindfulness, awareness. Instead of half a speed of brushing your teeth the same all the way every day, and then on the wild side. <laughs> <laughs> Start the bottom middle, you've never done that before. That's right. <laughs> what that does is actually gets you alive, <coughs> which means you don't have a good brush. You can always actually stop the breath or just, you know, just do something else. Just open your eyes, see who's nodding, see who's uh, meditating, and just, you know, just give yourself a foot massage. Just scratch your head, put your nose or whatever, <laughs> and then go back and meditate. Give yourself a look. Here I go. Is burglar uh, going in, burglar going out, as Freddy did on Mahasi noting? If so, why don't you recommend? method. It is because sometimes the noting, you can do that at the very beginning, but you have to stop the noting soon, otherwise it's too disturbing, it's more thinking. So it's best actually just to keep natural after a while and just stop all the noting business. But it's also a at the idea that mindfulness is all you need to do. You need much more than mindfulness. I am very, <coughs> very, very scared of my mum dying. She has provided me with a lot of emotional security and made me feel understood and not alone. I am scared that without her I will lose my frame of reference and possibly go mad. Do you have any advice for this? Um, one of the best things to do is to become a nun and have the security with that little shadow.